the first time I played Shenmue, I hated it. I thought it was funky. Um, it took forever to get out of the house and to get down the street. Um, I absolutely, in fact, I got it for free because I was working at Midway Games, and um, I, 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 and as a reward for doing a good job, um, my boss contacted Sega and went, um, you know, can you sort this out with Shenmue? And so um, that's what I wanted. So I took it home, played it, and I hated it, and I wanted to throw it away. And I thought, you know what, let's give it another go. Let's just give it one more go, put it back. And I started all over again, started right from the start, and I persevered with it, and I absolutely fell in love with it the second time around, absolutely. So when I think of Shenmue, I think of, it's almost like I've lived another life and um, where in, in this digital Japan of 19, uh, in the 1980s, and it's an, invent it's an adventure in my heart, effectively, that I've not completed yet. And it, it just feels like, you know, it's like when you think back to being a kid and the great times you had at school and with certain friends, I think of Shenmue in the same way. Now, obviously, technologically, it's been outstripped by the likes of your sandbox worlds that have been created. But at the time, it was incredible. You'd see people walking down the street and you'd look at them and you'd see the textures in their faces. You'd see that, this, you know, um, so when you no. met like a key no. character in the game, you'd see what how their fingers here? were modeled and their eyeballs were in their head. And you're just like, wow, this world is real. You know, look, people are going into shops, they're closing doors behind them, that they're opening umbrellas, they're going about their business. Um, and I totally believe that the world that I was in was real. But instead of just sticking to the game plan and going, right, I need to go and find the clues to, you know, find who, um, who, who killed his father and then avenge him, you know, you'd go and buy drinks. You'd go and buy little capsule toys. You'd go and talk to random people and see if you could explore as much of the world as possible, see if you could find little shortcuts um, around the world and get involved in things that weren't essential to the story just because you wanted to. And the fact that you could live out this other life um, on your Dreamcast was, um, I found very intriguing. It was so engrossing to be in that game. And <clears throat> what was the first, I think that was the first proper RPG-like game that I actually got into. And so it took me a while to get into it. And um, I just think I was really interested in, in exploring his world. To me, it was all about the interaction with the world. I mean, as Rio himself more is revealed about him as you know when you get the flashback scenes and you know being um, tr training in jujitsu uh, with his father or having breakfast with his father um, those were great but it's just you know how he interacted with the world and the things that he could pick up and the people he could talk to and the feedback they would give him to give him clues to help him progress um, that I felt connected with him then when I was allowed to explore his world through his avatar. You might think that the first film would have been a disaster. I was inexperienced, with poor equipment. However, travelling to Hong Kong to film a location piece about Shenmue invigorated a small fanbase into a hotbed of nostalgia and appreciation. The game was on, and I needed to make a sequel. Japan was our target, a bustling neon metropolis rich in history, light and sound. Home of Shenmue, my Graceland and Mecca. We travelled by car to Melbourne Airport. All I could think of was how much Shenmue meant to people. The comments saying it made them happy to see my first film. Then wondering whether I could do the first game justice. You see, Japan for me is so much more than just the home of Sake and Godzilla. By proxy, through video games and anime, I've lived most of my life there. And it was now actually time to see it. The Dreamcast, to many people, was an introduction to video games, and it's universally admired as one of the greatest consoles ever made. Shenmue started life on Saturn as an impressive technical display. However, due to the Saturn being retired, development moved to Dreamcast. It was this game that caught the world's attention through technology and detail that would only be possible under the vision of someone like Yu Suzuki. Playing Shenmue is an incomparable experience. You play Ryo Hazuki, who endeavours to avenge his father, killed at the hands of a mysterious man named Lan Di. Shenmue engendered love in its fanbase that has manifested into a constant thirst for more mythology, 
we're really quite dedicated. Why do I love Shenmue? Shenmue, more than any other game that I've ever played, really draws me into the game and immerses me into this world, this story, this character. And you don't feel like just a player, you feel like you are the main character, and not a lot of games can actually do that. And in my opinion, it's not just a game, it's a journey, and one that I think that everyone should experience at least once. A typhoon hampered our first flight, forcing us to spend a night in Tokyo. This vibrant neon city was our first introduction to Japan, and merely invigorated our desire to explore this amazing country. We would be following in Rio's footsteps, and we were excited to get back on track. Now, Japan was our oyster. Yu Suzuki didn't base the locations in Shenmue on many real places, just basing them in components of those places he thought necessary. Yokosuka, for instance, is a port town, comprising Dobuita and areas of residential development that resemble places like Sakuragaoka from Shenmue. Yokosuka is an important part of Japan's maritime history. During World War II, Yokosuka was a bombing target. However, during the Korean War, it played a major role in supporting US troops. Now it's home to both Japanese and US sailors. Welcome to Yokosuka. This is one of the biggest naval bases in Japan. It's a center of commerce from across the seas. And it's a place where a lot of people like to let their hair down during the night and the many bars and social areas around the city. Now this is also a very important place in Shenmue. And it's also a place where Yu Suzuki drew inspiration for many different places in Shenmue itself. Now this is where Ryo obviously learns more about Lan Di, gets a job, and basically just grows along with the player. Now while we're here, we're going to be looking at areas that inspired areas such as Dobuita, Sakuragawaoka, and the Yogska itself depicted in Shenmue. We're heading to an area that's known as the Honch. It's actually called Honcho, and it's where all of the sailors on shore leave go to be debaucherous, gamble, drink, and fight. Naturally, this is a not the safest area in Japan, so you can imagine that when Rio was around looking for sailors, this is the kind of place that he would have been going to bars in areas like the Honch in Yokosuka. See that thing behind me? That's a bunch of warehouses and docks. And this, unfortunately, this is as close as we can get, so I can't actually take you in there to show you around, show you what Rio would have been doing, uh, lifting crates with a forklift. This is basically as close as we can get. This is, uh, like I said before, when we got to Yokska, this is a giant commercial harbor, in addition to a naval harbor. So over there, that's where boats get loaded to obviously ship things off to different countries to mainland China, to Hong Kong, things like that. So yeah, uh, welcome to uh, Yokosuka Harbor. Dobuita is also important in Shenmue. It's where Ryo spends a lot of time in the story. And unlike the Dobuita in the game, this is just a street frequented by the sailors from bases in Yokosuka. If you recognize the name Dobuita from Shenmue, it's no mistake. This is Dobuita in reality. It's just a couple of streets but it's a really sort of active area. It's, there's a ton of navy bars, uh, interesting things to do, uh, westerner friendly places. A lot of places even take US dollars. So this is an area that is, although it's small, it's, it's packed with this little mini culture of its own. And it is significantly different from the way it was portrayed in Shenmue, obviously, because it is so small. But it's still packed with things to do and things to see and uh, we'll be overlaying some of those things as I'm speaking. Now, if you're a long-time fan of Shenmue, then you're probably familiar with vending machines like this. Now, vending machines are everywhere in Japan because everyone's pretty busy. 
and they're a nice and convenient way to get a drink or get something to eat. Now you might also remember from Shenmue that Rio downs these things pretty fast and it seems a little unrealistic, so I'm going to give it a try myself and see if you can actually do it. <laughs> that really hurts. Um, I was born in the early 80s and Shemu takes place in the, I'd say mid 80s I believe, uh, in uh, Japan and um, I didn't really experience a ton of the 80s. This game felt like, like a time trip. It just felt like it threw me right back in time. It felt like I was growing up in the 80s and I was right there along at Rio. I, I, I just felt so much for these characters and, and for the game itself that I really was pulling for Rio to find Londi and to uh, you know avenge his father's death. Just overall, I think the immersion is great. I know I've said it once before already, and uh, the graphics are amazing, especially they still hold up today. Uh, the sound, the music is beautiful, this, uh, the mythology of it all, but it also is wrapped into this, uh, this kind of realistic setting. So uh, just a great game that, uh, you know, what kind, how many games can you say where you can go into every single drawer in a room and open it and find things and, you know, have all these little quests and adventures and kill time but just have so much fun doing it. Many areas of Japan look like Sakura Goauka. The blending of modern with traditional Japanese style houses make areas like this in Yokosuka resemble Sakura Goauka from Shenmu. Right now we're in an approximation of Sakura Goauka. Obviously Sakura Goauka doesn't really exist. It does in a form but not in the form that we know from Shenmue. What we have found, however, is one of the many areas in Japan that is analogous to Sakura Goalka. It's full of these mismatched houses. It's this beautiful patchwork of odd abodes that just litter this hillside. And it's absolutely stunning. Um, I've never seen anything quite as charming as this. You know, not even the cobblestones of my home country of England could be as charming as this. So, Sakura Goalka. Here it is. Outside of these areas resembling areas from Shenmu, we decided to unwind and visit some famous landmarks, most notably Akihabara and Landmark Plaza. Welcome to Akihabara, otherwise known as Nerd Heaven. Um, as a lifelong otaku, this is insane that I'm actually here and I'm able to see all of this really cool stuff that I've heard so much about, like the junk stores and the uh, an electric town and all of the shopping centers dedicated just to electronics and video games and anime and doujin and things like that. So I'm really, really excited to be here and we're going to be looking around, having a look at some retro game stores, having a look at some junk stores. It's going to be awesome. Akihabara is a wonderful, vibrant district full of anime, movies and maids. It is pop culture incarnate. Wonderful stores like Super Potato and model stores litter the streets of Electric Town. A mecca for retro game lovers in Akihabara is Super Potato. Three floors of classic games and consoles some sleeping in glass cases, while the consoles themselves line the walls, and every game you could ever want fills shelving units floor after floor. In Shenmue, Ryo can visit the arcade in Dobawida, and although they have faded in the west, they remain alive and popular in Japan. On the third floor of Super Potato is a retro game arcade that also has slot machines and my personal favourite arcade game, Splatterhouse.
You might remember from Shenmue that one of the most important aspects of the game as a, as a side quest sort of thing was collecting capsule toys. In Japan, capsule toys are huge because they love collectible things and uh, cuteness and this sort of encompasses all of that. So this runs the gamut from an anime to like little plastic dinosaurs to... It's crazy. This is one of the best selections of capsule toys I've ever seen. And although they're not really a dollar or 100 yen anymore, uh, they're pretty expensive now. But this is just one of the things about Shenmue that uh, a lot of people don't sort of get is the capsule toy thing or why that's in the game. But it's because it's such an important part of Japanese sort of, I suppose, popular culture. Behind me is a landmark plaza, which contains something very interesting. Outside there are boisterous kids, but inside is an interesting little shopping center because we thought you'd like to see inside a Japanese shopping center, and something very special. Landmark Plaza is a different beast. It's a monolith in Yokohama, dedicated to shopping rich gold and marble surrounding stalls full of Totoros and Pokemon. One of the landmarks in Shenmue's landscape is Ryo's home, the Hazuki Dojo, a beautiful classical style house that Ryo both trained and lived at. So this is a close approximation of Ryo's house. This isn't obviously Ryo's house because it doesn't exist, but this traditional Japanese style dwelling is indicative of Japanese past that is punctuates the urban landscape of modern Tokyo, Yokohama and its surroundings. Now, in a mix of apartment blocks and western style houses, you can find these everywhere. And they're a great reminder of classical Japanese housing. We've just been walking through some clearings, up some stairs in Yokosuka, and it's a secluded little sort of wildlife and just coming up here and being away from the traffic and the noise and the busyness I started to hear things that just noises, animal noises and things that I would have heard in anime and video games for years and then coming here and then hearing those noises is surreal because this is normal every day for a Japanese person but for me, a, a white otaku who's grown up with anime and video games, hearing crow calls that I don't hear anywhere other than anime or video games, hearing Japanese crickets and cicadas, and just feeling this sun on me and seeing how orange it is, is indescribably fulfilling. Like, it's... it's I can't really describe the feeling, but I feel like I've done, I've accomplished something by affirming all of these things that I've seen and heard for years and never been able to experience myself. It's like I've crawled out of a hole after 24 years and I'm finally experiencing all these things in real life that I've just been looking at on a screen and hearing through speakers. And I just wanted to share that because it was, it's was it been profoundly moving for me. Our adventures were winding up, and with little time left, I wandered the streets of this vibrant city, lost in a fog of nostalgia. I was leaving what I identified with, a place full of fun and civility. I wandered those streets one last time.